We all know who's here today to can share with us. And uh, Jeff has just been a, a very, very kind, kind man. I met him a year ago at, at the uh, Mopars of the Bar Car Show. And uh, from that, a, a friendship has developed. And, and we talked a little bit about uh, why he does uh, all the volunteer work he does. Uh, I mean, he's constantly on the go. In that conversation, I found out he has a love for the Lord. And uh, in doing so, I asked him, would he please come here and share that with us? So today, I, I give you Jeff Bodine. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I got to apologize, everybody. I guess I was uh, invited to be here a month or two months ago. I'm not sure when it was, Sam. But you, you probably won't believe this, but I got Ham mixed up with somebody else. <laughs> I really did. His messages to me and someone else's messages, and I ended up going to the other function. I had two scheduled on the same day. I didn't realize it. And uh, so I, I apologize I wasn't here. I don't know who filled in for me. Probably Ham. I think he has the right name. Ham? Yeah, 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 right. I'd love to get in front of this microphone, but that was very touching what you did for your son. Uh, uh, I wish my sons had been here to listen to that. Because I think we all... If you're a father, you have sons, or even daughters, uh, and through our upbringing, we make mistakes. I, I know I made, a, made several with my sons, but uh, I know they love me now. I love both of them. And the four granddaughters I have. So, uh, have any race fans here? Yeah. Okay, well, that's good, because I'm a race guy. And uh, But yeah, I do uh, uh, share the same, hopefully the same feeling you have with, with our Lord and uh, what you do coming out this early, getting up this early in the morning proves that you do care about the Lord and you care about how He thinks about you. And I, I love this because uh, I always, uh, my philosophy on that is, uh, you know, some people go to church and some people do things and, you know, well, that's great, but you know, some people do it when they want to go to church. They don't want to get up early. They don't want to sacrifice their sleep time, or whatever it is. Uh, I like to do just the opposite, like you've done here this morning. I like to get up early, go show the Lord that I really care. Do it when it's not convenient for me to show Him that. I, so I, I, I get up early and uh, I'm in that first service. I go to Calvary Chapel uh, on the other side of town in a great church. And uh, so I'm in a First row, if you ever get there, or go online, you can see it online too. I'm the bald headed guy in the first row. <laughs> it's a pretty big church, right? Yeah. If you ever been there, and a lot of people don't go because it is a, a large church. And they, they tell me, oh, I don't want to go because it's too big. I like the small thing. I said, Well, guess what? I can solve that problem for you. Oh, how can you do that? I sit in the front row. I don't know who all those people behind me. I don't even look back. I just look at Pastor Mark. I, it's a small church to me because it's just him and me. And they look at me like I'm crazy. And as you've seen, I, I've hit some walls in my career, so I'm a little crazy. But uh, I, I got this little uh, little clip here I put together. Uh, it's only about an hour and a half long, so we can, we can check this out. As we go through, we're going to stop. And I'll, I'll, normally I play right through it and then I go through it slowly and talk about it, but uh, I won't do it this morning. This is uh, the beginning of my career. I, I grew up in Shemong, New York, upstate New York, farm kid, uh, dairy chickens, so, so I've shoveled all kinds of stuff. And, uh, but my grandfather and father built a racetrack when I was just five years old, or when I was a year old, excuse me. And uh, the local guys asked my grandfather to do that. So they dug up a cornfield and uh, made this dirt racetrack. And, but they made a little track inside that for the kids to drive and my father to race on. And my father uh, loved reading popular mechanics. And uh, he saw the plans to build this little racer in it. And so he, he built me that. I remember going to the little dungeon shop in 
way more than the ark when he was building and another guy. So that's me when I was five years old. I'm, I'm a little guy, not the big guy. <laughs> and I, I don't know if that's the first race I won there, but uh, it's obviously one of them. And I, you see on the little nose it says Dutch. That was my nickname back then. Uh, and because uh, when I was little, I, I talked like a little Dutchman. I still do sometimes, but they couldn't understand me. So my uncle, one of my uncles, named me Dutch. But that's the beginning of my career. This, this is, uh, has anyone ever been to North Wilkesboro Speedway? Okay, were you there that day? <laughs> that was in 94. Uh, I, uh, I owned a team back in those days, uh, the late Alan Quickie, when he was killed in a plane crash. I bought his team. And, uh, and that year, I, you can see I had XI Batteries as my sponsor. And uh, if you look at the little purple, uh, back then is when we had the Hoosier tires. And I was a guy that NASCAR, uh, I didn't do this on my own, uh, NASCAR, Bill France, asked me to run those tires because uh, Goodyear, there's a, they were uh, worried that Goodyear was going to be bought out. And uh, so to make sure NASCAR had some tires, he, he asked me to run these tires and get them ready in case they needed the Hoosiers. A lot of, I was criticized for doing it. They thought, most people thought I did it on my own and I was a jerk and messed things up. And actually, by me running the tires, good, it forced Goodyear to make a better tire. So I, I helped everyone. But the problem was, uh, Bill Francis never told anybody that he told me to run those tires, or asked me to run them. So after I quit running them, Goodyear was a little upset with me because I was the only guy that won on the Hoosiers. A couple other drivers used them. Darrell Walter used them. Uh, Lord Burton. Uh, a few other guys. But I was the only one at once. So Goodyear didn't like me very well. So the next year they made me some special tires. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anyone drive a truck, a big truck, you wouldn't want to run those tires on a big truck either. They were really special. But, uh, oh, you went a too quick. But anyway, that, that race is special. I've got it on this clip because you, that's okay. Uh, that day, uh, I lapped the whole field. I won the race by a full lap. And I'm the last guy to ever do that, and I'm gonna brag a little bit, pat myself on the back. In NASCAR, I'm the last guy to win a race, to so lap ahead of everyone. I didn't do it on purpose. It just happened, we had a great tire, had a great car. And uh, if you were there or watching on TV, uh, I was lapping Rusty Wallace, and he tried to wreck me. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, Russ and I, we didn't see eye to eye either. The late Dale Earnhardt and I, we were kind of friends off the track, but when he put his helmet on, I think, I think his helmet was too tight. <laughs> that was the problem. Anyway, he liked to run into people and be structurally, but uh, so that was that, that race. This year is uh, Victory Lane at Daytona. Uh, I won that race in uh, 86. I was Rick Hendrick's first driver. Henry Motorsports, and of course, uh, you can see it. We have, I think you can see it. Levi Garrett is our sponsor. Anyone chew Levi? I never did. They never made me. I used to go around with some bubble gum and uh, make it look like I was chewing, but it was just bubble gum. But uh, that's the Victory Lane Daytona. Uh, like I said, I was his Rick's first driver. Um, won his first Daytona 500. Won his first race at Martinsville. Anyone been to Martinsville? Great little track, a couple of guys, you know. I won a lot of races there, and, and the story goes, and Rick has told this many times uh, to all his drivers. And actually, did anyone see the, the thing on TV about Henrik Motorsports? Yeah. Uh, he, had, he had four of his present drivers and four of his fast drivers on, and did, a, did round tables and told stories. And I haven't seen the program. I don't know if this, this story is on there, but I told it. But Rick, uh, the week before Martinsville, we'd only raced seven races, and uh, he was just a small car dealer back then. And he came to Harry Hyde, my crew chief, and I, that week before Martinsville, said, hey guys, uh, I've spent a lot of money, a lot more than I thought I was going to have to spend. If something doesn't happen, I'm probably going to have to shut the door, I'm going to have to shut down. I mean, he, he committed to me about 15 races that year, that's all, but uh, he came to us and said, run out of money. So I kind of put the pressure on. I like pressure. 
And I'd won a lot of races at Martinville and, and uh, late models and modifieds. All told, I'd won 60 races there. So I, I had confidence we were going to do good. But uh, Harry Hyde didn't. He said, oh, Rick, I don't know. I don't think Bogart can do it. I got a little upset, you know. Back then I had a little hair. And it stood up and I said, Harry, I, I think you're wrong. Well, we went up there and won the race. And uh, most everyone finished. Earnhardt finished, uh, Allison's, Gant, all those hot shots back then. I don't know if David Pearson was racing there or not, but I mean, we, so we beat everybody. That was really pretty cool. But that's, uh, if I had won that race, it wouldn't be 100 motorsports. sports. And I told, uh, uh, told that story, like I said, in, in a little get together we had here a few weeks ago in Charlotte. They filmed us the show, and, and uh, Jeff Gordon heard it again, and Rick confirmed it. And Jeff Gordon goes, "Wow!" Now he'd heard it before. Apparently, he didn't believe it, the story. <laughs> but when he heard it again, and Rick confirmed it, he went, "Wow!" I said, "Wow! You believe it now? Yeah, man, that's that's awesome." I said, and I looked up Earnhardt, and I looked at Jimmy Johnson and Casey Kane. I said, "You all heard that, right?" Yeah, man. Thanks. I said, well, don't you think you owe me a little bit? <laughs> and Gordon goes, hey, the check's in the mail. I said, well, I'm not going to wait for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next clip. This is, uh, was anyone watching in 2000, Daytona, the, the truck race, Craftsman truck race back then? You were there. I was too. I was in that mess right there. I was in that mess right there. My son was going to drive to that race, but they asked me to to drive, I'd won there and had more experience, and, uh, and I said, yeah, okay. I saw I drove for this team later that year, but uh, I was, uh, I had a pit, I had a tire go down, so I had to go to the back, and I came to the front, and we were fast, you know, I was cruising, man. I, I was getting up high, and see, we didn't have restricted plates in the trucks the first time they raced there. We were going faster than the cars. So I get up high in the corner and just flinch out down and get a run out, passing everybody. I went from the back to the front. I just caught this group, the front group. Uh, yeah, Kirk, yeah, Kirk Bush was driving for Rouse then. And uh, the lap before this started, Kirk was uh, in a group of three. And I just caught him. And the lap before, I just told my crew, I, I swear, I told my crew, hey, I'm just right here, don't worry. I can pass these guys anytime. I'm just trying to be careful. That is being careful. <laughs> but it wasn't my fault. Uh, Rob, Rob Morgan tried to cut down in front of Kirk through the trial wheel, and he got clipped and turned him sideways. He hit another guy, and they both turned in front of me, and I hit him, and it threw me up in the defense at 190 miles an hour. So it wasn't my fault. I have a little video, you'll see that. But uh, the results were pretty devastating. I keep going through these little clips. This is a series of pictures, still photos that a, uh, a guy standing at the end of pit row was taking. He put his camera on automatic. I'm in that mess. Uh, if you look close, you can see me. If you can tell what it is. But when I hit the fence, it, the big cables cut the whole front off right at my feet. The engine flew out. Then it ripped the roll cage off the top. That's me in there, sideways. And you see the no engine. That was flying down the track. and. Uh, You know, I, I was tumbling in another truck right at me. Go ahead, keep, keep flipping these. There I am, my arms back. Yeah, I hurt pretty bad. I, I worked out two weeks later. There I am upside down. You can see my helmet in there. You can see nothing's in the front. Uh, something hit, yeah, hit me in the head. I got my arms up like riding a roller coaster. Hee! It's a lot of fun. But I was kind of unconscious. There my arms sticking out the side. And if, if you look close at the picture, you can see my glove was coming off, and they did come off from all of the force. <clears throat> what do we got there? Okay, that's that's the only picture that bothered me. That's me laying on the track. That's my arm, my head. That's how I ended up. That's the only, a, a fan took this picture from the grandstands, obviously. And uh, that guy just put the fire out that I was laying in, and I thanked him all for what they did for me that day. But keep going. Uh, this is a video here. Just let's watch this. And 
See, they, they, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> I'll let that perfectly clear. It wasn't my fault. Eight people in the stands were hurt with some debris. If you can turn the sound up, we got some neat sound. I don't know if you can. Not quite that. Got David. There I get hit by another vehicle and a little fire. And uh, pretty spectacular, right? As soon as I was asked earlier, what's it feel like to go 200 miles an hour? And I said, it feels great till you hit something. And when I hit the wall, it knocked me out. So all through this, I was Their troops. That was one of them uh, in the Persian Gulf with the Navy. Uh, I've been to Iraq twice and Afghanistan once. And uh, if you don't know, I uh, built BOPSA for our U.S. BOPSA teams. And that's the after they won the gold medal in Vancouver here uh, three years ago. I was there, freezing. It was very cold. <laughs> Standing on ice on top of a mountain. Not real <laughs> landless sport. That's the four athletes. The gentleman on the right, your right is, or your left is the driver, Steve Holcomb. I, oh yeah, we, yeah, we, uh, I had a, uh, a race, NASCAR drivers and drag racers, off-road guys, whoever we could get, 10 of them. We called it Jeff Lowe and Bowser Challenge. It was on Speed Channel. I think we had eight shows. Um, the last uh, race, we had Joey Logano, won one of our races, and drag racer Melanie Troxel won the other. She beat all the boys. <laughs> and she, she won the first one, and they got embarrassed, and Joey had to get a little more serious, and he, he just barely beat her in the second race. Go ahead, the next clip, I don't know what's next here. But yeah, I'm real proud of uh, being about, being able to get involved in building those bobs. And that's the four guys with their medals. And the nickname for the sled was the Night Train. Because of all, it was black. We didn't paint it red, white, and blue or anything. But uh, yeah, this is the victory lap. From the first flag to the Daytona to the Olympics. Uh, now, keep it going. And turn the volume up a little bit. Yeah, there's something here. I think somebody put something on there. I, I'm not sure what it is. I think AJ Harris added something in the end of it. Can you get it going? There you go. See. I love that music. Uh, keep going. Uh, let's... When you need a newer pre owned car, you need a Monfrey's Chrysler. Every new car comes with warranty for everything. Monfrey's Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram on a classic Chrysler Dodge Ram. Monfrey's Chrysler Mazda Kia Evo and Melbourne Attack Ram. Monfrey's Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram on a classic Chrysler Dodge Ram. Monfrey's Chrysler Mazda Kia and Melbourne Attack Ram. I thought he said something about, about me. <laughs> and you also get warranty forever at Jeff Ram. Yeah, I the only Honda motorcycle dealership in America with warranty forever. Come see all the new models at Boniface Hires Automotive, where after we sell, we serve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I didn't know that was on her. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, racing uh, has been very good to me. It's been a little tough sometimes, too, but... Uh, it's, uh, it's, the only, it's the way I ended up here. I ended up with a Honda motorcycle shop with AJ Hires. That's how I met him. Uh, it's, it's the only way I could have afforded to uh, build Bobsled for our American athletes. And we're still doing that. Uh, we're not for profit, so they've never had to pay for one. Uh, we have a fleet of 18 that they're using right now. They've been racing this winter already. Our, Steve Holcomb has uh, been doing really well. I think he's won three. This is a World Cup season, not the Olympic season, but he won three gold medals in a two-man. And uh, our girls are all new this year, so they're learning. They're, they're uh, 
getting better. But I mean, that's the only reason I could afford to do that is because of racing NASCAR. So NASCAR has been very good to me. But uh, it also uh, has led me to be standing here right now. Uh, you know, I grew up on a farm like yourself. And uh, we raced Saturday nights throughout the summer. So Sundays uh, I was at the racetrack cleaning up. And so I was in a church. We went to church some back in those days. The Baptist and Methodist church in town. I even went to Sunday school a few times, but that wasn't a it wasn't a every week thing. I was a farm kid, man. You had to get up more. Anyone a farmer? You know, you work. You work hard. So you gotta milk those cows and sell shovel that manure. You collect the eggs. You get chased around in a chicken coop by the roosters. And that was me. <laughs> but so it so church wasn't a you know, we believed in God. We believed. had belief, but we didn't walk the walk. And uh, so I went through my early days of racing from that little go-kart to uh, modifieds. Uh, I, won, I won over 600 races. And uh, I'm pretty busy. Uh, one year in 78, I raced 84 times. I won 55 of them. That's in a Guinness Book of Records. The most... Uh, Races won by in, in the NASCAR series by Angle. Pretty proud of that. You know, Richard Petty won a lot of them, but not in one season, not that many. Uh, so I, I was just busy, and, and things were great. You know, winning races, had a family, a wife, a couple kids, dogs. Nice house up in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I uh, thought things were perfect. And they were. Except uh, I won a race in Darlington, a late ball race, talking to a gentleman about that just a little while ago, and uh, that, that changed my racing career. I ended up, I, I beat, it was a Saturday late ball race, and I was following David Pearson, he was the best at Darlington, and, and my first time there, I said, I'm going to follow him, he's going to show me how to race this track. Man, no better guy than David Pearson. So I followed him, he showed me how to be careful, how to pass. And, I ended up winning a darn race, beating him, Earnhardt, Gann, Allison, I beat them all. I mean, this kid, first time there. The next day, I got a phone call from a NASCAR a cup car owner saying, hey, we saw what you did. You can win at Darlington, you, you, know, you can win anywhere. Uh, you want to drive my car, so I, that's how I got my cup right. I went in that race at Darlington and uh, following David Pearson. And so I, I you know, I got had I had everything I wanted. I mean, the reason I started driving that little racer was to go to Daytona someday and win the Daytona 500. So man, it's all working out, right? It's all coming through. I'm on my way. But unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, it really is fortunate. I woke up one day and I wasn't very happy. Man, I had everything. I had money. The cows, family, loved me. Had a ride. Everything I've ever wanted in my life, but I was I was pretty unhappy. And uh, start searching on why. I mean, why did I? Why wasn't I enjoying all this? And I figured it out. It was I didn't have God in my life, you know. And so I started searching how to get him there and how I could get in his life. You know, it's not just him and ours. It's we got to get in his. And uh, I found out, you know. I, it took a couple years. That started in 82. and 86, I was, uh, and, you know, I'm not saying this is why I won Daytona, not, in, not at all. But 86, I was driving home from uh, Charlotte to Greensboro. The race team was in Charlotte. And just teamed up with Gary Nelson, still driving for Rick Henry. But he switched crew chiefs with me. And, so Gary and I were down working late on our car with our guys, getting ready for Daytona. And it was about 2 in the morning, I was driving home in a nice IROC Camaro. You know, that's what we used to drive back in those days. Chevrolet used to give us cars to drive. That was boy, man, now i got to buy them. <laughs> but uh, I was driving home, and I, I was about halfway home from 
Charles de Greensboro, and it just came out of me. You know, I was thinking about everything, and that's when I, you know, gave myself to the Lord, accepted Him, asked Him to come in my life and see if I could come in His life. So pretty, uh, pretty emotional time. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget where it was. The great work. The two lane went to four, lane, and so I never forget that spot. Because <laughs> I wasn't speeding. It was only at 2 in the morning, I mean, I right, come here, come on. <laughs> I think I pushed the pedal down more than, because I wanted to get home and tell my wife. But, uh, but that's when my life started changing. You know, I, I started appreciating things more of what I had, and family. It wasn't just the money, I mean, that's, you know, we all need it to pay the bills, but uh, it was... Uh, just appreciate life, but learning about the Lord and you know, asking for help. You know, I wanted that joy back in my life. But things got difficult there. You know, I don't know if you're right, your experience with the Lord and how it's been, but I know mine my life was like this until because you know Satan had me. And the Lord, he, Satan had me. But when I asked the Lord to come in my life, my life started going like this, up and down, up and down. Good days, tough days. But that's that's what it's all about. And, and this little accident was one of those days where uh, uh, a lot of people looked like a tough time. You know, people still tell me, man, that was a man, that was a terrible, that's a bad accident. I said, no, that was a good accident. Bad ones are the ones you don't survive. That was a good accident, very dramatic, but it was good. And that was good for me because during that accident, uh, like I said, I was knocked out my conscience, which is a good thing. You don't remember all that bad stuff going on. But that's when uh, I had a, uh, my dad had passed. And I had, he came to me during that accident and uh, looked at him. He looked great. When he died, he wasn't healthy. And he got after semen, so he was on oxygen, not very healthy. And when he came to me, he was smiling, looked great, had his hat on. Had, I have two brothers that raised. Had Brett, Todd, and Jeff on his hat. He was proud of us. Back then, we were all racing. And uh, I looked at him, and it was, it, you know, you hear a lot of these near death experiences. Has anyone ever experienced one? Yeah, you, you know. And they're all different. Mine was just, my dad was just in a, there was this white background behind him. But like I said, he looked great. You know, and, and the Bible says, you know, we die, go to heaven, we all, young people get older and old people get younger, I, you know, don't know what that age is, but he looked great. He wasn't old and wasn't sick. So I, I believe something happens. And I looked at him and said, Dad, I'm coming to see you. And he said, no, it's not time. You have more to do. So I'm truly blessed. And, and you know, my, my take on that is that was the Lord telling me through him that I wasn't going to die. This wreck wasn't going to kill me. Because this wreck happened for a reason. It didn't just happen. I actually asked for it. I didn't ask for it. But I asked because, like all of us, we're all the same. We all go through some tough times in our life. Has anyone been through tough times? Yeah. Still going through some? Yeah, we all do. We're all the same. Doesn't matter if you drive a race car, hit a baseball, sweep the floor, drive a truck, and all that. We all go through the same. We're all the same. And we're not special. Some, talking to somebody earlier, some athletes, and some types of commentators, they think they're special, but they're really not. Hopefully, they find that out before it's too late. Because we're all the same. And, um, but yeah, it's, I don't know where I was. Where was I? I've had a lot of walls on. you got to understand. <laughs> I have an excuse why I forget what I'm saying. <laughs> but no, we're all the same. And, and, uh, Yeah. 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 
the dead. Uh, you're saying you're thankful for the accident? Yes, for it. It was a purpose. Oh, that's it. I asked for it. That. I you asked it. for it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, because, like I said, we're all the same. We all go through tough times. Well, I've been through plenty. I can tell you about them, but plenty. Ray knows. He's, he's seen a lot of them. You know, deaths and divorce and sponsors not paying me millions of dollars. And I had to lose a race team because of that. Changed my, my son, one son's career. Changed mine. You know, just, but, I don't know, I don't know. But, you know, I made it through. How, how did I make it through? Because I had faith. I prayed to God, help me. I was driving at Iraq Camaro down the road plenty of times after divorce. I was going to hit that medium. Wide open, man. I was going to end it. I couldn't take it any longer. God kept me going straight down, straight down the road. He, he wouldn't let me go off the road. I had one leg over a balcony 18 stories up. I was all by myself. I was going to jump. I, had a, I couldn't take it any longer. He pulled me back. Nobody else was there. It was my faith. It was him. So through all those things, I finally... I mean, I prayed. I used to drink a bottle of wine at night to go to sleep. Anyone ever do that? Yeah. And then go race. Come on. You can't do that. So I, I said, Lord, I can't do this. Help me. Help me. I, I can't. This isn't right. And he did. He showed me. He, he told me. He said, pray. I'll put you to sleep. So I started praying. Go to sleep. I wouldn't get halfway through the prayer most of the time. I'd be sleeping. Wake up in the middle of the night, start praying again, go to sleep. <laughs> Wake up in the morning, pray. Wake, I drive in a race car, I pray. I mean, I start praying, praying, praying. Who believes the power of prayer works? Yeah, we all do. It works. It works. I don't have to drink that bottle of wine anymore. That was a long time ago. You young guys, oh, they're, they're not even listening. Okay. That's good. Don't need to hear that one. But, uh, So, you know, I learned that my faith was strong. And, uh, you know, I could, people that go to church and people say they believe, and, you know, they can fool a lot of people. And we know that. In the church, there's people that don't understand uh, that what they need to do to really prove their faith, right? It's, uh, they're everywhere. I'm, I'm not criticizing, but they just haven't learned. You know, I learned that you, know, you have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and uh, then you're okay. And I did that a long time ago. And, but he, he got me through all these, my faith, his faith in me, got me through all these tough times. So, I, you know, one night, I don't know what it was, I said, well, I'm going to change my prayer I don't know if I can do this. I said, God, I don't know if I can do this, but I want to repay it. Can you repay God? I don't know. I said, I don't know if it is, but I so I just started praying. Like, Thanks and for what you've done. Kept me from running into the median, jumping over the balcony. Um, so use me. Just use me some way to show people that, um, that believe in you that this, what you can do for us if we do truly believe. We truly have faith. You know, you can fool people, like I start to say, but you can't fool God. He knows what's in your heart. So it's obvious that I'm still alive. He knows in my heart it's, it's, it's true that I truly do believe it. have faith. It's not just on the outside, it's on the inside. That's where we have to change, on the inside. So he... Uh, He saved me. There was nothing mechanical it did. You saw the big cables ripped it apart, ripped the top off. Now I put the seat in. <laughs> I put those seat belts in. I always tried to do that to make sure they were mounted properly. But, so I didn't fall out of the thing, but <clears throat> the protection around me definitely was God's protection because the roll cage was gone on the top and, and the front was gone. I, I mean, I should, should not have survived and and through that accident, if you listen to the, uh, if you're there or listen to the uh, announcers, you know, they, they're going to tell you I was dead. They didn't know it was me for a while because nothing was left. My mother was home watching. My sons were there. Uh, Ray was there. Um, 
fiance was there, uh, friends, sister, watch it, and they all thought I was dead, my mother's home. And so as they rolled me to the ambulance, and I caught it, uh, that's when I reached up. Okay, now I'm in all this pain, right? I woke up once as they're, that I wasn't breathing when they got to me. I talked to all the safety guys. <clears throat> and they, if you timed it from when it happened to when they got to me to get me out, it, it's several minutes. So uh, they said, you weren't breathing when it got to me. You know, we thought you were dead. They did my seatbelt to get me out. That's when I started breathing. Well, that's why I, I came to. I never opened my eyes. I never talked to them. But they had to cut one bar off. It was all my legs down. They said, you actually helped us to get you out. I said, man, how did I do that? I asked the late Dale Earnhardt about that. He said, it's just instinct. You know, it's in our instinct to get out of a race car. If it's upside down, right side up, or whatever. So that was just instinct. <clears throat> but I remember coming to and thinking, uh, uh, okay, where am I? Okay, Daytona, truck race, accident, that I passed out again. But then I, you know, all the pain hit me. <laughs> I realized I was in some pain. I broke this wrist, crushed the vertebrae right in my back. But somebody asked me about what was broken. Uh, that's all that was broken. But believe me, from the top of my head to my toes, everything hurt. I was stretched and, oh my goodness, I was, had some serious pain. They are giving me morphine. I said, excuse me, you got anything a little stronger? <laughs> this isn't working. And uh, I actually took so much morphine, I almost died from my open weren't watching how much I was pushing that button. I pushed it all night long. They came in, I had every blood pressure. Thank goodness I survived. But, uh, but yeah, as they were rolling me, the, the ambulance, that little oxygen mask slid off my face. What's that weigh? About an ounce? Just a little plastic thing. Now, how did I feel that slide off my nose? And then reach up. When the cameras were on me, it wasn't behind the truck, it wasn't where people could see me. I reached up to put it back on my face. They thought I was trying to get it off, but I was actually trying to get it back on my nose. Well, I mean, to me, that's, that was God let me show people that I'm, I was alive. It was a miracle. He gave me that miracle. He, uh, thousands of people saw it there, but millions around the world have seen that clip. They used to saw it, see it. It's on YouTube. You can look it up. A lot of hits on there. So a lot of people have seen that. A miracle that God gave me from an accident where you can't survive. There's no way whoever that is is gone for sure. Benny Parson was the announcer back then, the late Benny Parson. He said it's the worst accident he's ever seen. It's been voted the worst accident in NASCAR where anyone survived. So how can how can somebody survive that without the grace of God? There's no other way. And a lot of people through the years, I've said, man, you're lucky. And I said, no. <laughs> man, you can't be that lucky. I'm truly just blessed. God just blessed me that day. So, uh, you know, I, I talking to somebody back in the back about it earlier, about race drivers today. You know, things have changed, like everything. And uh, race drivers today are making a lot more money than they used to. But they're still uh, accept accessible to race fans. That's the way we've been brought up in racing. And uh, but see you know, how everyone has opinions about these new guys. They don't know them. The baby boomers, who, the core of NASCAR fans, don't know these young guys, and so they don't care for them sometimes. But all I can tell you is, from my experience, most of them are pretty good guys because they make a lot of money, but they give a lot these foundations, they're raising money for charities, and so they do give a lot. So, you know, you might not like them on the racetrack, but off the track they're good guys, so uh, uh, appreciate what they do. Yeah, you, you can want them to see, see them get spun out on the track. But <laughs> they don't get spun out when they get off the track. They're sharing that, that wealth they're giving, so they're all good guys. But, uh, I mean, that's, that's my walk with the Lord. I mean, it went from just 
sporadic to full time now. Uh, and Ham, uh, thank you for inviting me. He recognized that, I guess, and I appreciate that because I, I do like to talk to people about it. There isn't a day I go by that I don't talk about the Lord with somebody. That's our, that's our mission, right? To get as many people to accept Jesus as we can before it's too late. Had a friend die just a couple days ago, and uh, I talked to him about it, but I, I'm not sure if he had, had accepted the Lord. So I'm worried. Like I said, I've had a lot of laws I can't remember. Darn it, I can't remember if I ever got him to, to do that. But I will remember. It takes a while sometimes, but uh, hopefully he did. Anyone have any questions you'd like to throw at me about racing or anything? Yes, sir. You know, uh, <laughs> we were asked this question, a lot of drivers were asked this question here, I think it was about a year ago. You know, what, what's the most important thing anyone ever said to you in your life? You know, a lot of drivers, I don't know what they even said. The first thing that came to my mind is, and who was it? I said, it was my Aunt Rhonda. Uh, this wife's still racing hard modifies, uh, working a lot, of and uh, you know, doing things I shouldn't have done, saying things I shouldn't be saying, acting like I shouldn't have been acting, but just busy, busy, busy. And she said, Jeffrey, don't talk that way. Don't act that way. You need to go to church, get with the Lord. And she was right. <laughs> so that's the most important thing that anyone ever said to me. It took a while. but. She's still alive, and she knows it. I remember that, what she told me. And, uh, but no, I, as far as uh, anything else, I read some books. Uh, I got a Bible. That's the best book you can have. Read that thing, right? Read it, read it, read I read it today. Of course, today you can do it on your iPad. It's a lot easier to take that on an airplane. Yes, sir. With the, with the economy being where it is, if you would be so bold to all of us supposedly Christian guys here in the room that we could do to say witness and help the economy at the same time. Well, yeah, witness, we get them. You know, that's, that's amazing what that does. You, know, you hear a lot about it and you have a lot of, some people are very skeptical about tithing, but uh, it works. Um, you know, I've been through some Tough financial times myself. You know, I'm not one of those rich race drivers, like a lot of people think. And uh, but you know, I tithe through it all, and you know, I'm still here paying my bills. I've got a Honda motorcycle shop with a friend here in town. AJ Hires a great guy. And you're driving Hondas, Harleys. <laughs> we take trades, you know. <laughs> we take a lot of trades at Harley. Ray rides a Harley, I gotta bust him on that. Yes, sir. Two part question. Uh, you're in and you're out, it's national What was the toughest competitor that you competed against? And uh, given the demands, the physical demands of NASCAR, do you think Dan Patrick's going to race a full schedule? Do you think she can win at this consistently? <laughs> First question is a lot easier and less controversial. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, who's, who's the tough guy we're racing against? You know, um, you hear a lot about who's the best basketball player of all times. Who's, you can't do that. Who's the best racer of all times? You can't do that. You cannot do that. Back before I was racing, you know, guys like Fireball Roberts, they were the best at that time. And then you go up for David Pearson. Then it was Richard Petty. And then it was the Allisons. They had their time. You know, we had seasons. You know, we can talk about that in our, in our Christian life, seasons for everything. And right in, in sports, racing, and life, we all have it. And, you know, the late Dale Earn was the best in his time. Jimmy Johnson was the best. Jeff Gordon had his time. His time to struggle lately. Jimmy's been a guy. 
And now it could be Brad Keselowski the next several years. Who knows? But we all have a time. So who's the best? Yeah, I mean, Kelly Arbrook. Not just tall, but man, you wouldn't want to get in the ring with him. He was tough. So, uh, yeah, and I had my time. I was right there with Earnhardt and Allison's and Harry Gant and all those Pearson. So, yeah, they're all, believe me, if you go out there and want to go fast, it's tough. It doesn't matter who's out there. And Danica's find out how tough it is. Um, you know, I, I really, I really uh, appreciate women drivers. There's a lot of really, really good drivers, women drivers in our country, around the world. Uh, and a lot of them do well in road racing. Uh, some uh, short track stuff, they do well. But as they move up, things get a little tougher. In any cars, um, I've driven in any car. Uh, I was headed that way early in my career. But I came south instead of went west, but they were pretty dangerous back when I was doing it. Uh, any cars are a lot easier to drive than NASCAR. They have white tires, they have wings, that downforce, they're real low, they have power, they have brakes, they have everything you want in a race car. And NASCAR has everything you don't want. Skinny tires, they're up high, the center of gravity is high, there's not a lot of downforce, not enough power for the weight, not enough brakes to stop it. Um, there's nothing, nothing good about it. It's all, that's what makes it so tough. Thank goodness it's tough because it's only a handful of guys can do it. And even out there today, there's only a handful that can really do it. Now, look, there's a lot of good drivers out there. They don't have good cars. And you've seen it. Some of the guys had a good car. Now they don't have a good car. They used to run in the front. Now they run in the back. So you got to have the team. you got to have the car, the equipment. And that takes money, and that's hard to get today. So not everyone has the right equipment. But uh, what is it, Venus Mars? Men, women, we're different. And the way I explain it is, uh, women think women stuff. <laughs> Clothes and frilly things. I don't know how they think. I'm out one. But men, we think mechanically. So when we get in a race car and something isn't right, we can we think better how to figure it out what's wrong. We can figure out how to drive better. Because we, we think different than women. We're mechanical, more mechanical up here. Now, some women are closed because they can do pretty good in a short track situation. But when you get in NASCAR, it's so hard, they can't figure it out. They can't translate what's going on to the brain, to their arms, their hands, their feet, and, and make it work. NASCAR is that hard. It really is. When I got first time I sat in NASCAR, I realized how tough it was. So my thought was, and I suggested this to uh, John Saunders, the president of uh, ISC, NASCAR, uh, two years ago now. It's been, hasn't happened yet, obviously. I, I'd like to see a, a women's driving series, just for all girls, all women. Because there's a lot of talented women out there, but they can't, and they shouldn't have to compete against the men. Like they don't do in football, baseball, basketball, volleyball, tennis. No, they, they don't have to. The only sport, the only racing type sport they do really, really well, I commend them for that, drag racing. But straight, four seconds is over. Now they got a lot of nerve, I'll tell you that. Women, some women have a lot of nerve. And they, they, they can go straight. They can keep it going, and they have nerve to push the gas down with that 8,000 horsepower. I, I don't know if I want to do it. Well, Nellie Troxel, she she has, I'm not sure she's the fastest, she's had the fastest time, or one of, one of the girls has. Maybe it's the other girl. Uh, but that's about the only thing they can really compete against the guys in. But it's, it's, it's very difficult, but it's straight. <laughs> and it's over quick. So, yeah, you don't have to be physically fit. I'm not way in any drag racers out there. These guys are in shape, a lot of them, but some are. And the same in NASCAR. These guys work out hard. I used to work out every day and always eat the right things to be the best I could.
But now the guy's even going farther. I look at Carl Edwards. He does backflips. I mean, he's got arms on Mark Martin's arms are hard as this floor. I mean, just huge. You don't have to be that way, you know. But he is, and some are. But they work out a lot. The guys up front are. So yeah, women. I love them, but they don't need to be an asshole. I was way too long. Yeah, one more. One more. This is kind of a graphic question, and please forgive me, guys, but I've always wondered this. Picture the scene: you're driving, and you're in the car for a couple hours. I know they have devices that, hey, I got to take a whiz. You do it. <laughs> what about if you know you got to go number two? How does <laughs> number one question asked of a race fan? What do you do if you have to go to the bathroom? <laughs> I'm going to do a little demonstration. Where's the stop All right, now look. Now look, you're sitting in a seat. It's made just for you. So it's really tight. You know, really tight. Everything, you don't want to move around. Can't move your shoulders, your head. Boom, everything's tight. Down here is tight. You got the seat belt on. As tight as you can get it. And the shoulder belt's as tight as you can get it. You got a belt coming between your legs as tight as you can get it. Because, and, and as a race, as you compress, which you do, there's not much padding in the seat, so it's not the seat that compresses, it's you. So you're always tightening them up. After the race, you unhook them and you say, how did I ever get them on? That's how tight they are. But you compress. <clears throat> Sit in a chair with your knees together. <laughs> feet out, try to go to the bathroom. I can't do it. I've had to once in my career. Actually, twice, Dover, Delaware, I, I drank too much before the race. Had Gatorade as a sponsor, and I, I had some new drink I was trying, and I drank way too much of it. And halfway through the race, we used to race 500 laps there, about four and a half hours, four hours, 45 minutes. Halfway through, I broke a rocker arm, so I was on seven cylinders, I wasn't going to win, and I'm riding around, and caution came out, I said, I said, Harry Hyde was my crew chief. I said, Harry, I gotta go to the bathroom. <coughs> well, Bodine. <laughs> you never knew Harry Hyde, that's how he said, Well, Bodine, go ahead. <laughs> Nobody's watching. <laughs> right? <laughs> Harry, I can't. <laughs> so what do you mean you can't? I said, I can't. Well, Bodine, you just, man, don't come in here, no pit stops now. <laughs> Keep going. Well, I kept going another two and a half hours, two hours, whatever it was left in the race, and I'll tell you what, my bladder hurt so bad. You know, Dover's banked and rough. It was, oh, it hurt, 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 and I wasn't going fast, so it, I had time to think about it. <laughs> so I drove in, they dropped the flag, I drove in the pits and in the garage, and I did the belts and just kind of fell out of the car and just went to the bathroom right there. So that's how you go to the bathroom. <laughs> After a race your pants. It happened once at Pocono. Remember when Bobby Allison got hurt, hit and wrecked? I won that race. Well, after when he got wrecked, uh, they stopped the race. And I'm sitting over, it was pretty early in the race, and I'm sitting on a back stretch and just waiting for him to clean up. We didn't know how bad it was, but it was bad. I said, man, I gotta go to the bathroom. Pocono was a long race. Long race. Another four hour and a half race. I said, man. There's no grandstands on our backside. I'm looking around. I said, where are the TV cameras? I didn't see anything. I didn't tell anybody at the time. So I undid my seat belts and just kind of eased out of the seat and went to the bathroom. And I told the guy, hey, I'm going to clean up afterwards. But uh, that's the only way you can go. Believe me, when you're in that seat all squunched up and tightened up, you can't go. Now, I have thrown up in a race car. But that was in Charlotte. But to go to the bathroom, now, to do number two, <laughs> remember when Tony Stewart went to Watson's Glen? He went get out of the car in Victor Lane. He got sick, had a stomach fire, and he messed his pants, and he... So you can't do that. That end works, the front end don't work. <laughs> Not for me. Anyway. Thank you for listening to me, guys. And, uh, hey, I've got some cards, if anyone needs an autograph, and i got two... Two pretty neat deals here. You know, I one day tell them, here's a ring for that. I bring them out so people can see them. But 
I'm just a part of that Olympic gold medal in Vancouver. Here's an Olympic gold medal ring you can look at too. So come on up here and look at these things and uh, if you need an autograph, I got it. Thank you. Thank you for the four years. You did a great job. Your vision is reality. Let's pray, guys. Almighty God, we thank you once more for giving us this living example of a life that um, has recognized you exist, that you are a good and providential God, that um, for those of us that awaken to your grace, that there is healing, there's forgiveness, there's power, and there's direction. We ask that as you take us into this day, we would recognize all the good things that are around us, how you're working within us. As we go about uh, the, the duties and tasks of the Christmas season, help us to do them with joy, recognizing the message that is behind it all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.